Father, we pray that you would use Psalms 56 and 57 to help us go on all the way to the end. And Lord, we pray that in the midst of our difficulties, our confidence in your word would be unassailable. And we pray, Father, that the cry of our hearts would always be that you would be exalted. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was in college, I worked at a camp called Canacuck Camps, and I always used to hear Joe White, the director of Canacuck, tell this story. So I'm giving you the source of my story here, because the story is so moving and so powerful that eventually I decided to go try to find this thing, and so I just started Googling phrases of, that I remember Joe saying, and sure enough, it came up, and it turns out that the source of the story is chicken soup for the soul. <laughs> Notwithstanding, it's a great story, all right? <clears throat> so in late 1988, there was a massive earth earthquake in Armenia. Maybe you've heard me tell this story here before. I think I've mentioned it before. Over 30,000 people died in less than four minutes. And in the midst of all of that, there was a father who... His family was secure at home, his wife was safe, and he rushed to the school where his son was when the earthquake hit, and the building was rubble. And he remembered, he was there at the school because he remembered this promise that he had made to his son. He had told him, no matter what, I'll always come for you. And he began to weep as he looked at this pile of debris and it seemed hopeless. But he began to visualize in his mind where his son's classroom was. And so he went to this back right corner of the building and began to shift the rubble and, and dig through the mess. And as he was digging, other parents came and, and they're, they're lamenting and, and wailing over their children. And then they begin to tell him, it's too late, they're dead, G go home. And he simply responded, will you help me? And then he just kept digging. The fire chief showed up and said, it's too late. They're all dead. Go home. We'll take care of it. And he said, will you help me? And he just kept digging. The police came. Same thing. Go home. We'll handle this. Will you help me? He dug for 8 and then 12 and then 24 and then 36 hours. And in the 38th hour... He moved a, a, a piece of concrete, and he heard his son's voice. And as he, as he began to call out to his son, his son said, Dad, I told the kids not to worry. I told them that if you were alive, you would save me. You would come for me because you promised, no matter what, I'll always come for you. That's what we have here in Psalms 56 and 57. We have David resolutely returning to God's word in the midst of crisis. I would invite you to open your Bible to Psalm 56. And as we look at Psalm 56, we are going to see David extolling God's word in the midst of massive difficulty. David has a promise from his father, and that promise is what holds him fast in the midst of these trials. As we, as we look at Psalm 56, uh, you notice there's this superscription that reads, to the choir master, and then the ESV renders this, to the dove on far off terebinths. If you're looking at uh, the, the New American Standard or maybe the King James, they just bring the Hebrew letters into English letters, and so they give you a phrase that might not mean anything to you. Um, perhaps this is a tune name. We're not really sure what this phrase means. Or, or maybe it's a tune meant, meant to evoke an image. Maybe you're supposed to think of a bird uh, on flying through these far-off trees, and maybe that's supposed to uh, give you sort of a peaceful scene. But then there's this sort of jarring change. It says, a miktam of David. We don't know what a miktam is. 
But Psalms 56 through 60 all have this word miktam in their superscription. It's also in Psalm 16. But then this phrase that we do understand, when the Philistines seized him in Gath. And, and that is the scene that Paul read earlier in the service. So remember that David, because Saul was trying to kill him, David had been anointed king over Israel. Saul didn't appreciate that, so Saul started throwing spears at David. And for, for whatever reason, I don't understand why David would do this, but David decided that it was a good idea to go to Gath, where, where, where Goliath was from, right? Goliath of Gath. So David had killed the champion of Gath. Maybe they'll take me in. I, I don't understand the logic there, but that's what he did. He went to Gath. And then the Philistines, they grab him and they bring him before the king. And the king is initially pleased to see David, but then he's reminded of this is David, their champion. They sing about him. Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And, and, and at that point, David realizes, I'm in danger because I'm in the hands of my enemies now. And so you remember that David, he, he feigned insanity and then he fled the scene. When the Philistines seized him in Gath, so imagine yourself, imagine how you'd feel if you were in this situation. Uh, you are alone and you are held captive by your enemies. And that's what David is facing here. Prompting him to pray here in Psalm 56.1. Be gracious to me, O God. So once again, we see this resolute Godward focus from David. David's mind first goes to the Lord. This is, this is uh, challenging because even this week, um, facing difficulties, facing discouraging situations, this is not where my, my mind went. I didn't immediately think, be gracious to me, oh God. But this is, what, this is the way David is thinking. This is what the Bible is, I think, teaching and modeling for us. He continues, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. I don't know who the attacker is. Maybe it's Saul. Uh, may, but, but whatever the case, David is speaking of himself as being harried and harassed all day long. And then verse 2, the same language is used again. My enemies trample on me all day long. For many attack me proudly. Attack, attack, trample, trample, all day, all day. The, the repetition of these phrases increases the burden that David is feeling as a result of all this. So, so David is in great difficulty. And then look at what he says in verse 4. He says, In God, whose word I praise... And that is, that is such an interesting phrase, whose word I praise. It's interesting because what it brings to my mind is the way that some people in our day will, will sort of derisively say, well, you people are bibliolaters, as though you could be idolatrous about the Bible. In God, whose word I praise. Now, I, I'm not suggesting that anybody should idolize the Bible, but I am suggesting that I think that's a silly comment to make. Here it is in the Bible. Now, I don't think David means I'm worshiping the Bible. But we can praise things that we're not worshiping, can't we? We, we can be really happy about things that we're not necessarily worshiping. And, and I think what David is saying here is, I am so thankful for God's word. W what is he referring to? Well, probably all the scripture in general that he has up to, up to the time of his life. But more particularly, I think what David has in mind, I mean, I mean at this point in, life, in his life, he, he has, we don't have 2 Samuel 7 yet, but he does have the prophet Samuel anointing him and saying, you're going to be king over Israel. So I think that in particular is what David has in mind. God told me through the prophet Samuel that I would be king of Israel. In God, whose word I pray. I'm thankful for that, and I praise God's word. In God I trust. So there's no misplaced trust, right? There's no, there's no divide between God and his word for David. By praising the word, he's really praising the one who spoke the word. 
And by trusting the word, he's trusting the one who backs the word. In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. Now think about the logic here for David. These guys have seized me. I'm vastly outnumbered. They could easily put me to death or confine me for the rest of my life. But it's not going to work. They are not going to prevail against me. They will not succeed against me because God has said, I'm going to be king over Israel. In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? They've got nothing that they can do to me. God is going to keep his word. No man, no flesh, no human being is going to prevail against God. Now, the Lord has not told any of us, you're going to be king of Israel. But we do have some some really significant promises from the Lord, don't we? Things like, he who began a good work in you will complete it. Things like, we all are... As we, as we behold this, this image of the Lord Jesus Christ are being transformed from one degree of glory to another into the same image, there is no stopping it. It will happen. In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? This in spite of his circumstances. Look at, look at verse 5 where he he elaborates on his circumstances, and it's interesting how there's a, there's a connection between verses 4 and 5 that is slightly obscured by the ESV. So you look at this phrase in verse 5, all day long, that, that repeats language from verses 1 and 2, and then they render this, they injure my cause. But there's a little footnote, little number 3 after the word cause, and down in the margin it says, or they twist my words. So I I think that's the better rendering. They twist my words. Maybe you're looking at a translation that renders it that way. So think about the juxtaposition of verses 4 and 5. In God, whose word I praise, while these people twist my words. What, What seems to be happening is David is dealing not only with the Philistines, but also probably with Saul and Saul's partisans, and they are using things that David says against him. They're twisting his words. They're distorting his meaning. They're misrepresenting what he's saying. And he's saying, my confidence is in God's word. You can twist my word, but my confidence is in God's words. Then even the next phrase in verse 5, all their thoughts are against me for evil. Well, what what are they going to be thinking? They're going to be thinking in words. They're going to be communicating plots with one another for evil against David. And David, in spite of that, is confident in God's word. Verse 6, they stir up strife. It's not hard to imagine the way that they can misrepresent what David... This happens all the time, even in our culture. You misrepresent what someone says, you stir up strife against that person. They lurk. They watch my steps as they have waited for my life. For these, these people are trying to kill him. They are trying not only to misrepresent him and give him a bad reputation, they want him dead. And that brings us to verse 7. And verse 7 is, is the central statement in Psalm 56. This is, this is sort of the main thrust of this psalm. David says, For their crime, will they escape? If, if, you're, if you happen to be looking at this in Hebrew, we can talk about the way it reads later. But let's just, for now, go with the way it reads in English. In English. For their crime, for their activity, are they going to get away with this, David asks? And then here's the, here's the real gist of what he's saying. In wrath, cast down the peoples, O God. This is an imprecatory prayer for judgment to be brought against David. Why would David pray for the judgment of his enemies? Because his salvation is going to come through their judgment. That's why. Because when they're smashed, he's delivered. And so God, David is praying for God to defeat all these workers of evil, all these people that are opposed to the Lord and his purposes and his anointed and his kingdom in wrath. Cast down 
the peoples. What gives David the audacity to pray something like that? You're going to be king over Israel. That's what gives him that audacity. He trusts that God has promised to him that he is going to be king of Israel, and he's basically saying, Lord, do it. Bring it about. Now, uh, verses 5 and 6 are going to be balanced by verses 8 and 9. Because all this harassment, this, this, this uh, misrepresentation of David that you see in verses 5 and 6, and all the pain that that causes him is now recounted in verses 8 and 9 as he says to the Lord, You have kept count of my tossings. It's like David is saying, Lord, you know everything I've been through. And then, and then he gives the Lord a command in the next line, put my tears in your bottle. It's like David is saying, don't forget any tear that I have cried in response to these situations. Keep track of all of it. And then he asks rhetorically there at the end of verse 8, are they not in your book? Are, are my tears... Are my pains, my wanderings, is all this not recorded with you? What, what David is saying is, Lord, I am confident that you are concerned about me and that you are aware of all my pain and discomfort. And that reality is enormously comforting. God knows the pains of his people. There's this great, great straight statement back in at the end, very end of Exodus chapter 2 when the Egyptians are groaning and, and crying out because of, of their, their slavery and the, the harsh treatment of the Egyptians. And Exodus 2.25 says, God saw the people of Israel and God knew. If you're suffering, if you're being persecuted, if you're in difficulty... Be comforted by this reality. God knows. He has not forgotten. He has not failed to see. And he will not stop doing justice. God knows all the pain of his people. And because God is paying attention to David, David is confident that he's going to hear. Look at verse 9. Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. David is able to be certain that God is with him and God is for him and God is paying attention to what he's suffering so that when David calls on the Lord, the Lord is going to go into action on, him, on his behalf and deliver him. And when God delivers him, the enemies are going to be turned back. End of verse 9, this I know, that God is for me. And that reiterates that idea that was stated earlier at the end of verse 4. What can flesh do to me? And then verse 10, verses 10 and 11, almost word for word repeat verse 4. Verse 10, in God, whose word I praise, in the Lord. Again, one of these rare instances of the reference to the Lord here in this section of the Psalms. In the Lord, whose word I praise. He repeats it. This is the third time he said this in the psalm. And the, again, the repetition, it increases the, the fervor and, and the, the passion of, of what's being communicated. In God, whose word I praise. In the Lord, whose word I praise. In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? I don't know if you've been in one of these situations where you're, you're very frightened and you're trying to counter the fear with, with words like this from Scripture. And I, in, in my experience, as I've found myself in these kinds of situations, I find myself saying these phrases over and over, maybe, maybe repeating a verse over and over. And I, I get the sense that's what David is doing here. It's like he's working through the fear that he's feeling, and he's repeating this this assertion, in God I trust, I will not be afraid, because he needs to keep saying it. He needs to keep saying it because he needs to keep pushing that fear out of his heart and mind. And then, because he's confident in the Lord, because he believes God's word, verse 12, 
I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you. I think there's a resolve here to worship. There, David is in the arms of his captors. And where's he going to go? He can't go. I, I, maybe this is what led him to Gath. He's got no place else to go because Saul's trying to kill him. And so of all places, he goes to Gath and he can't go there. Where's he going to go now? Well, he doesn't know the answer to that question, but what he says is, I must perform my vows to you. I must continue to worship you. It's like what David is saying is, I believe your word to me, and I'm going to praise it into existence. I'm going to praise you, and I'm going to worship you, and I'm going to trust that that is going to bring me through to the day when you keep the promise that you've made. And then the last phrase, last verse, verse 13. For you have delivered my soul from death. Now, I don't, I don't know at what point David wrote this psalm. I don't know if he wrote this psalm while he was in, in Philistine captivity or after he got out. Let's say he was still in Philistine captivity, just hypothetically. What would David mean on that, on that reading? You have delivered my soul from death. I think we would have to conclude that he's thinking of other instances in his life where the Lord has brought him through. And, and you can just think of the things that he said to Saul. A bear came and took one of the members of my father's flock, and you, you carried me through. You kept me alive. A lion came and took one of the sheep, and you, you kept me alive. I went out to face Goliath, and you've delivered my soul from death. And you can see how the logic is working, can't you? You've protected me in the past. I'm going to trust you to protect me now. You've delivered my soul from, from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. So David is confident that God is going to keep his word. What we see in Psalm 56 is the persecution and the life-threatening danger posed to the true king of Israel. And as you read the Gospels, what you see are the same kinds of circumstances experienced and endured by the ultimate king of Israel. In the same way that David was rejected by the establishment, Jesus was reje rejected by the establishment. David fled to Philistia at various points in the Gospels. Jesus leaves the land of Israel to go out among the Gentiles. And the opposition that, that David faced is fulfilled ultimately, typologically speaking, in the opposition that Jesus faced. David's suffering fulfilled in Jesus' suffering. And both passed through the suffering on the way to glory. There's something else that both David and Jesus, we can see about both David and Jesus here in this psalm. They both knew that God would deliver them because they knew what God had promised them. And, and as followers of Jesus, we want to lay hold of the promises of God to us. And then when we face difficulty, when we face really hard situations, or maybe, maybe in our marriages, maybe with our children, maybe with uh, our health, whatever the case may be, what we want to go back to are these promises of God. And we want to believe he began this good work in me. He's going to complete it. God will keep his word. And like David, we can say, in God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, what can flesh do to me? Psalm 57, same song, second verse. I mean, it's like, the, it's like here we go again. David goes from one difficulty to another. It's sort of the way life is, isn't it? Look at the superscription of Psalm 50, 57. To the choir master, according to do not destroy. And we don't know what this phrase do not destroy means or, or what it is. Maybe it's a tune name. Maybe it's a music style. We don't know what it, what it, maybe it's a phrase meant to set the mood, right? Maybe David just means to say, when you read this psalm, think of me praying to the Lord, do not destroy. I don't know what the phrase means. A miktam, there's another one of those words we don't know, you know, we, I just mentioned it a minute ago. But here's a phrase we understand, of David, when he fled from Saul 
in the cave. There's actually two occasions when David was in a cave. One of them we didn't read this morning. Um, it's, it's, a time, it's, a, it's a vivid account that you probably remember. Uh, David and his men are hiding in the back of the cave, and Saul goes in there to cover his feet, which is a euphemism um, for something that people do when they cover their feet. And um, one of David's henchmen says, uh, if, if you don't know what I mean, we can talk about it later. One of David's henchmen says, <laughs> I'm sorry. One of David's henchmen says, um, let me go over there and remove his shoulders of the burden of his head. And David says, David says, no, we, we can't stretch out our hand against the Lord's anointed. So David refuses to kill Saul in the cave. I don't think that's the account we're dealing with because... Because I think these psalms are juxtaposed, and right after the account of David going to the Philistines in 1 Samuel 21, he hides in this cave of Adullam at the start of 1 Samuel 22. So I think that's what we're dealing with. But we're still dealing with the persecution of Saul and a situation where David has nowhere to go. And again, he's saying, that I, don't, I do not know why they translate 56.1 and 57.1 differently. They are exactly the same in, in Hebrew. So 57.1, I mean, I think they should do them consistently. Be gracious to me, O God. Be gracious to me. It's the, exa- it's the exact same phrase um, from 56.1. The ESV renders 57.1, be merciful to me. I don't know why they chose to do that. But again, you've got this repetition. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me. And, and the repetition increases the urgency Now think about the next phrase, for in you my soul takes refuge. Physically, literally, David is hiding in a cave. Figuratively, he's taking refuge in the Lord. It's like David is saying, this cave is not going to protect me, and I don't expect it to. I'm taking refuge in you, God. And then again, speaking figuratively, there in verse 1, in the shadow of your wings... I will take refuge. Now, I, this is figurative, right? God doesn't have wings, but, but it's as though, it's as though, you remember that, that time when Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem and he says, I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks. It's like David is using an image like that. I, I'm going to take refuge under the shadow of your wings, then at the end, till the storms of destruction pass by. And then he continues, and and verse 2 shows us that he's thinking in Psalm 57 the same way that he was thinking in Psalm 56. I cry out to God most high. We'll come back to this idea of God most high in just a second. To God who fulfills his purpose for me. Well, what is God's purpose for David? You're going to be king. I'm going to send my prophet Samuel. He's going to anoint you. And and as David says, I cry out to God most high, what he is communicating is that there is none higher in dignity, authority, or power than the Lord. There is no principality who who outranks God. There are none who were before him. There are none who supersede or go beyond him. And there is none who will outlast him. He is the most high God. And this God, who is the greatest of all, is the one who has purposes for David. So David is absolutely confident that this God, the Most High, is going to fulfill his purposes. So as in Psalm 56, where David's praise for God's word celebrated God's promise that David's throne would be established So here in Psalm 57, the purpose of God is going to be fulfilled in David's life. He will be established as king of Israel. So in the midst of danger, God's promises of good for David give David confidence that God is going to deliver him. How does that work? How does does somebody's promise it? Well, it all goes back to God's character, doesn't it? Is this a God who's going to keep his promises or not? David says, verse 3, He will send from heaven and save me. He will 
put to shame him who tramples on me. There it is again. Salvation through judgment. And then Selah. And then he says at the end of verse 3, God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. Those are familiar terms, aren't they? Steadfast love, that's hesed. That's, that's, this is who God is. And faithfulness, you could render this truth. This is what God says of himself back in Exodus 34, 6 and 7. A God merciful and gracious, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. So on the basis of God's character, on the basis of who God is, he's a steadfast, loving God. He's a faithful God. David says, he's not going to make a promise to me and not keep it. He's going to activate that promise. He's going to send out his steadfast love and faithfulness, and he's going to fulfill his purpose for me. Verse 4, he again describes his situation, the difficulties that he's in. He says, my soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts. And again, this is figurative, isn't it? David is not, there's not like a herd or a pride of lions that David decides, I think I'll just walk out there in the midst of them and lie down amidst those killers. No, that's not the situation. There are people that are trying to kill David. And, And essentially what he's saying is, I am surrounded by people who are trying to kill me. Look at the rest of verse 4. The children of man whose teeth are spears and arrows. It's like they want to eat him alive. Whose tongues are sharp swords. Every word they speak is, is like a sword intended to pierce or hack David to pieces. That's the situation he's, he's in. And, and when I first started uh, reading this psalm in preparation for this sermon, verse 5 seemed very jarring. It's, I, I was like, wait, where's the on-ramp to verse 5? This seems, this seems like a total leap from one idea to what's going on here. Verse 5, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. It's like one of those lines that you want to you pull out and put into a song. And what about the previous verse? Well, we'll just leave that one alone. That one doesn't have anything to do with the song that we're singing. But yes, it does. What's the logical connection between verses 4 and 5? The logical connection is God will show himself to be the most high. God will exalt himself. God will show that there is no force of evil in heaven or on earth that can overcome him when he delivers David. When God delivers David, all of God's enemies and all of David's enemies will be put down shown to be inferior to the God of the Bible. That's what David is praying for. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens by delivering me. That's what David is saying. Let your glory be over all the earth. And I think what he means is, uh, I'm, I'm the king in the line of the seed of the woman, and when you establish my throne, we're going to start expanding the borders of the realm where you are known, and your glory is going to start spreading over all the earth. So I'm calling on you to exalt yourself in my life and make it so that your glory spreads through my agency, through my reign. And I think we should pray in this very same way. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens by giving me victory over what tempts me, by giving me victory over the sins that habitually show the flaws in my character. Give me victory over anger. Make me Christ-like. Give me victory over impatience. Give me victory over worldliness. Give me victory over lust and pride and whatever else. And then let your glory be over all the earth. Let your glory expand over the dry lands as we tell the gospel to people and they turn to you. They agree with us that the God of the Bible is the most high. And the place where you're known and served and worshipped and and present with your people expands over the earth. Now again, I think think verse 5 is the centerpiece of Psalm 57. And that would mean verses 4 and 6 are, are corresponding to one another. And I think they are. I think they're, they're meant to sort of be mutually interpretive. 
So the enemies that David has spoken of in verse 4, he speaks of them again in verse 6. But here he's going to talk about that boomerang or rebound effect of sin. They set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way. But they have fallen into it themselves. Selah. There are people digging pits for Christians right now. There are people plotting right now how they're going to ensnare us. They're, they're, they're setting the nets out. And, and we should pray like this. Lord, cause all of their evil machinations to do this, this kickback thing on them. Deliver me from their snares, their nets, their pits, their traps, and, and let, them, let their evil be self-defeating. And then verses 2 and 3 similarly correspond to verses 7 through 10. Notice how at the end of verse 3, David talks about God's steadfast love and his faithfulness. Look at verse 10. Your steadfast love is great to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Verse 7, David says, my heart is steadfast, O God. And he repeats it. My heart is steadfast. Where does he get this steadfastness? He's filled his mind with the Bible. That's where it comes from. He's, he's able to push out the fears. He's able to push out the anxieties and the doubts and the dangers. He's able to drive all that out of his head because his mind is full of the Bible. My heart is steadfast, O oh God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. He's in a cave, and Saul's after him, and he's just escaped from the Philistines. Everybody's trying to kill him. And again, it's like he's saying, I'm going to worship my way to the throne. I'm going to praise God's kingdom into existence. I will sing and make melody. Awake my glory. I think, I think that da the reference to David's glory here is the reference to him being enthroned as king, established as king over Israel, and then the goodness of God's program is seen and, and actualized and known and experienced by people. And David is calling for that to awake. Awake, O oh harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. What's the dawn? Well, I think he's referring to something like the sunrise from on high that's going to that's gonna dawn on God's people. And it's like David is saying, I'm going to sing God's kingdom into existence. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. Because of verse 10, for your steadfast love is great to the heavens. Think about this. God's steadfast love is great to the heavens. That means that God's loving kindness, the hesed of Yahweh, pervades and saturates the atmosphere around us. And, and this is our experience. Whether, whether we're conscious of it or not, whether we acknowledge it or not, the oxygen works for us. The atmosphere works for us. Gravity holds us. And, and everything in all creation is perfectly fit for us because of the loving kindness, because of the, the steadfast love of God that is great to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. You, you, could, you could render this faithfulness or truth either way. Same, same ideas, right? God's truth pervades the universe. There is no escaping it. There, there's no hiding from it. There's no undoing it. This is a point that's made at every funeral. Every funeral testifies to the truth of God's word. The wages of sin is death. But God's, God's truth, it pervades all reality. And God's steadfast love pervades all reality. Making it, God's steadfast love, making it so that any sinner that turns from their sin and places his hope and trust in this God will we'll receive God's mercy. That is an astonishing offer. Don't you, if you're, if you're here and you're not a believer, don't you want to join the psalmist and the people of God in verse 11, crying out, be exalted, O God, because of who you are, 
because you're the most high, because there's none like you, because your love and your truth pervade all reality. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. There is a day when everybody's going to see that. There is a day when King Jesus is going to come and the God of the Bible will be exalted indeed over all the earth and the glory of God is going to cover the dry lands as the waters cover the sea. And from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, everyone is going to know God's goodness. Everyone is going to see God's glory. And if you've got eyes to see and ears to hear, you see it even now in all creation. The atmosphere is flooded with God's loving kindness and his truth. And if God, if God obey, David is giving a command to the Lord in verse 5 and 11, be exalted. If God obeys that, that wish command, that prayer command of David, David will be delivered. David's enemies will be defeated. Evil will be crushed. And the throne of the king of Israel will be established. And God's character and glory, infinite in its goodness, boundless in its satisfying power, will spread over all the earth. Psalm 57 shows that David has a clear understanding of the connection between God's purposes for him personally and God's intention to make his name great in all the earth. That's what David is praying, right? David is saying, Lord, this is the way that you can exalt yourself. This is the way that you can make your name great in all the earth. Throw down my enemies and establish my throne. The scion of David, King Jesus, also had a clear understanding of the connection between God's purposes for him personally and God's glory. Go read John 12 through 17 and read how many times Jesus says, glorify yourself, Father. God is going to glorify himself, most particularly in the death and resurrection of Jesus, so that he can be just and merciful. And along these same lines, along these lines, we should think through the connection between our lives and God making his name great in all the earth. And we should pray like David and pray like Jesus. We should pray that God would make his name great in our lives in accordance with the way that the New Testament says he will do just that. Jesus said, I will build my church. God, be exalted as you use me in the upbuilding of your people. So help me teach this Sunday school class for your glory. Help me to to serve the people in my small group to your glory. Help me to be faithful to my accountability partners for your glory. Help me to, to recognize the needs of my brothers and sisters in Christ. Make me faithful to pray for the things that I say I'm going to pray for. Make me faithful to follow up with a phone call to somebody that looks like they need to talk about something. Make, give me ears to hear. Make me a good counselor. Make me useful. Be exalted above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Make my evangelistic witness fruitful. Cause people to want to believe in Jesus when I tell them about him. Help me to understand how to communicate in a way that will make them want to know Jesus. We have a father better than the one who went and found his boy in the rubble. He's, he's bigger and better. And he's worthy of our life service. Let's pray together. Father, you are the one whose word we praise. You are the one in whom we trust. Help us never to be afraid. Because man, flesh, can do nothing to us. And be exalted, Lord, above the heavens. Cause your glory to fill the earth. Defeat the enemies of the gospel. Break the teeth of the wicked. Cause them to fall into their own pits that they have dug, hoping that we'll fall in and break our legs. Lord, cause their evil to rebound on them and use that, we pray, 
to lead them in kindness to repentance. Cause them to see that their rebellion against you is futile. And make the name of Jesus the name above every name at which every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. To your glory, Father. Amen.